Okay, yeah, uh, this is, this is going to be, uh, I've been doing this particular lecture since 1987. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, and uh, the, the history of it is I was working in a private treatment center over in Muscle Shoals, actually, and we had a four-day uh, family program. And uh, the first day was addiction education, and I was kind of over the addiction education part of the program, and my director said, I want you to come up with a lecture that when non-addicts walk away, they'll say, I understand addiction. And I said, well, why don't you give me a hard chore to do then? <laughs> uh, and so I, I kind of thought a lot about uh, uh, my, my philosophy, which, I, of course, I got from uh, other people. And the very idea of this thing, actually, and last week I, men I mentioned uh, Dr. Vern Johnson uh, he wrote a book in 1978, I think, called I'll Quit Tomorrow. And, and when I read that book back in the day, and I was had the opportunity to do some workshops, well, actually with Doc, got to meet Dr. Johnson, and, uh, and pretty much the way he described addiction, it clicked with me. I happened to be in recovery myself, and it, and it fit what, what had happened to me in hindsight. Uh, and so a lot of my philosophy comes from uh, still the old school, I guess, from Dr. Johnson. Uh, and so I, I kind of got this idea of a feeling scale from his book, I'll Quit Tomorrow. But I doctored it and messed with it and made it more elaborate. And uh, so I'm going to have to give him credit for, for the idea of a feeling scale. This is more of a, we're not thinking about the brain in this. We're talking about the emotions. And this is more the way that you those of you who, are, who are, have been in addiction and in recovery, I think you will really identify with it. But I think family members who have watched a person in addiction will also say, that looks familiar to me. I think I've witnessed all of that. So hopefully when you leave here this evening, you're uh, going to say, well, that's a, I've never thought about addiction in that way. So I use models a lot uh, to talk about things because models tend to take something that can be very complicated and tend to simplify it somewhat. So this is a model about the emotional uh, predisposition and the emotional toll that an addict takes in addiction. So it's called the feeling scale. We're going to talk about the scale to make sure everybody understands it first. And then we're going to plug two people into the scale. Uh, I haven't changed the two people I've been using all these years either. Uh, they're both 16, one's named Tom and the other one's named Sam, and we're going to introduce them to their first mood-altering substance, and we're going to see what happens to them once they experiment. Uh, and you're going to see that they take different paths, and it has a lot to do with an emotional predisposition. Just another way of thinking about addiction. Okay, so... Now let's, let's talk about the feeling scale. What I've done here, and I'm not quite done with it, I'm saving this in uh, for the last to put it up, but what I've done here is I've, I've put uh, feelings on a scale of 1 to 10, and we got 8 up there now, okay? Uh, and the lower the number, the more negative the feeling is. So this will be our negative end of the feeling scale. And as we go up the scale, the feelings become less negative or more positive, whichever way you want to look at it. So this is our positive end of the, of the scale. Now, let's just talk about this, and then we'll plug Sam and uh, Tom into it, and we'll introduce them to... We're going to use the drug alcohol to introduce them to their first experience because in my, uh, all of my years in working in treatment, I've done many thousands probably of intakes when you ask them information. And uh, I would say 95% of the people that I have done intakes on uh, will say that alcohol was the first drug they used. So that's, that's the drug we're going to use. Uh, down here on this end of the scale, at number one, the most negative feeling, and I, I have to think this is probably the most negative feeling a person could have, I call suicidal despair. Now, despair means hopelessness. Uh, when a person's feeling of hopelessness reaches a degree, 
that they are questioning the most powerful instinct they have to survive, I would say that's the bottom of the feeling barrel. Now, there are a lot of different degrees of suicidal despair. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're bringing people into treatment, you have to do what's called a suicide assessment risk. And, and when we're doing that, there's different degrees of suicidal uh, assessment. Uh, you have your vague ideations. It could be, well, I don't really care if I don't wake up in the morning. You have your idea ideations that are a little bit more concrete than that, I'd like to die. Then even more concrete than that, uh, I'd like to kill myself. More than that, I'd like to kill myself, and I know how. That's called ideations with plan. I, I've got a plan to do it. And then, of course, the most, and then you have suicidal gestures. Uh, it may be a person takes the bottle of pills or, or takes the gun out of the closet and fools with it and looks at it, and uh, they're, they're doing suicidal gestures then. And, of course, the most extreme uh, would be a suicide attempt. So there are all different degrees of that, but I've kind of lumped them under one instead of breaking them down individual. Uh, now, when, when and I, like I said, I've been doing this lecture for a, a lot of years, 27, whatever years that is, uh, 28 years. Uh, and I always, I, I do this lecture for patients, and, and I worked in residential treatment for the, the whole 30 years of my career. And uh, so I always ask patients, after I get through describing the different types of suicidal despair, by a show of hands, I ask them, how many in this room have experienced some degree of suicidal despair? And when I do that, I've been taking a poll for all these years, and it will consistently be about 80% of the people in the room who are in residential substance abuse treatment will report that they have experienced some degree of suicidal despair. Now, I don't know, but I'm going to guess that if I had a room full of non-addicts and I asked that same question, I don't think I would get anywhere near that percentage of people. I call non-addicts earth people. I told you that last time. I don't think earth people experience uh, suicidal despair at near the rate that addicts do. So anyway, uh, now the next most negative feeling, it's not quite there, but it's its first cousin, I call deep depression. Now I'm not talking about everybody gets depressed from time to time. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a deep depression. Uh, Chip got depressed here not long ago when Ole Miss kicked uh, Mississippi State's butt. Uh, we're not talking about that. He got over that pretty quick, didn't you, Chip? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You didn't get into it. So let's talk about what I mean when I mean a deep depression. Uh, it's something that's very debilitating, okay? Uh, let's say it lasts unabated for at least 24 hours. Uh, let's say that, let's, let's talk about a person who is in a deep depression. Uh, they isolate, uh, don't even like sunshine. A lot of times they'll pull the shades on their house. Uh, don't want to be around other people. Uh, sleep patterns, what about sleep patterns? Very, very extreme sleep patterns, either insomnia or hypersomnia. Either they, they can't sleep or they, uh, or they uh, sleep all the time and wake up tired. Uh, appetite, extreme, either n no appetite or can't get enough to eat. So we're talking about something now that, that again, uh, addicts, and let me, let me put it this way, Anyone who has experienced suicidal despair has experienced a deep depression because that's what they were experiencing when those thoughts came to their head, I don't know if it's worth living or not. So anybody who said yes to a number one can also say yes to number two. Now, there are people probably who haven't experienced suicidal despair but have experienced deep depression. So anyway, it's not, I, I say it's not quite as negative, but it's its, it's first cousin. Now, let's go up the uh, scale and look at number three. Again, not as negative as number two, but still very negative feelings. And last week we talked a lot about this, as Chip said, about the conflict between values and behaviors and how addicts continue to do that due to their addiction 
And, and we mentioned last week that, you know, when I ask addicts on a regular basis, if I ask you to list everything you feel guilt and shame about, uh, and you did, and then I ask you what percentage of the stuff would not even be on your list if it, if it wasn't for your addiction, then most addicts end up saying about 90% of the things I feel guilt and shame about would have never occurred. So that's a big, big issue with addiction is guilt and shame. Now, I put grief down here, too. You might not, uh, that is an E there. Uh, grief down here. Uh, a lot of people don't, uh, I think we touched on that maybe last week, too. Uh, a lot of people don't, I think uh, a lot of people don't see as big uh, of an issue as grief is as I do in addiction. Uh, you know, grief is a sense of loss of when you lost something. And in addiction, you, you take tremendous hits. Uh, you, you lose relationships, uh, you lose your dreams, you lose your aspirations, you lose everything, and there's a tremendous amount of grief uh, in, uh, in addiction for the addict and certainly for the family members who are watching. Uh, and we, I think we touched on it last week. I'm not sure I do so many lectures. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, one issue, one stage of grief is anger. I'm going to go ahead and put it down here. See a lot of anger as a result of the grief, too. All right, so guilt, shame, grief, and anger. Let's talk just briefly the difference between guilt and shame. I think I touched on that. Guilt is that negative feeling I have when what I do goes against what I believe in. Behavior, conflicts with values. I feel guilt about the act. Or it could be what I didn't do that I think I should do, okay? So I can feel guilty about doing something or not doing something that I think I should do. So that's guilt. Shame is the feeling about what I am, what I have become most of the time as a result of what I did. Thou shalt not steal, and I steal, and I feel guilt about the act of stealing, but I feel shame because I have become a thief, and that's not what I believe I should be. So they're, they're real similar, but they're, they're, they're a little bit different. All right. So these are all negative feelings. Now, any one of these feelings alone, I would say, is not as severe as a deep depression. But I think when you take all these feelings like, like happens in addiction, and through repression and the denial system, they get all pushed down out of the consciousness, and I really believe that causes, and I'm not, I'm not discounting uh, the, the other stuff that happens in the brain, but I believe that's a big reason a lot of people get deeply depressed is because they have so many of these feelings. And, and many of you have lost a loved one and you went through a, a, a lot of deep grief and you even entered into a depression maybe. Uh, so if you take all these feelings and squeeze them together and you don't know what to do about them, then they'll eventually become a deep depression. So you see what I'm doing as we're going up the scale, they, they're a little less intense. Now, let me take number four here is something that addicts are real familiar with, especially in early recovery. And those of you who, are, uh, who have been in early recovery, are in early recovery, are family members who have witnessed a person in early recovery, you're very familiar with these feelings too, restless, irritable, and discontent. Uh, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about that in the, in the doctor's opinion, the beginning of the book. It says, it talks about the alcoholic, says he is restless, irritable, and discontent unless he can again experience that sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking that drink. So, but once he takes that first drink, he gets into a spree and he comes out on the other end all remorseful and everything. So, you know, you see a lot of people that are in recovery and family members who have watched somebody relapse, it's very likely that you were aware the person was going to use before they were aware because you probably saw this happening. You saw them getting restless, irritable, and discontent. All right? So those are negative feelings, but not quite as negative as this. Now, on number five here, I put neutral. I, uh, that's just a dividing point between the negative and the positive. I don't guess you can really feel neutral, uh, but it's my lecture, so I can say we will, okay? <laughs> I can do what I want to, can I? So, uh, so let's say number five is neutral. Now let's go up to some positive feelings. 
busy and entertaining. Well, you say, well, Gary, those are not feelings either. Uh, well, let's say positively distracted, all right? Busy and entertained. Uh, you'll notice addicts in early recovery, not just in early recovery either, addicts for years and years sometimes really, really need to stay busy or be entertained. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? But addicts uh, tend to make very good workers. You know, uh, I'll, I'll share some personal stuff. When I was a child, before I ever, my first drug I ever used was alcohol at age 13. But when I was a child, before I ever experimented with mood-altering substance, in hindsight, I was very restless, irritable, discontent. Let me put another one down here. Bored. I bored easily. It took a lot to hold my attention. But I remember my mother saying to me as a child, and I, I was a pretty fortunate child. I had horses to ride and uh, pools to fish in and woods to hunt in and those kinds of things. But I always was bored, and I remember saying to my mom a lot, I'm bored. And she would say, you think you have to be entertained all the time. And boy, that would really, really frustrate me. But she was right in hindsight. She was absolutely right. Because I was very, very restless, irritable, and discontent. And the only relief that I got from that was either being busy or entertained. So that's kind of a no-brainer. If those are my only two options, then I'm going to really like to be busy and entertained. And it carries some of that into my sobriety. I've been accused by people who've known, I'm getting old now and I'm slowing down, but I've been accused by my wife, who knows me better than any other human being, of maybe being a workaholic. Uh, I do. I enjoy staying uh, busy and entertained. Uh, I don't deal as much with restless, irritable, discontent as I used to. I, I think she would agree with that, I hope. Uh, so anyway, that's a six. Now let's go up to seven and talk about happy and content. Now we're going to have to take a few minutes here to, to, to clarify something for the, for the uh, content of this lecture here. Happy is a word that we use all the time. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, one of the most a very widely used word in the English language is happy. And I'm sure I probably heard that word when I was still an infant, maybe three weeks old. Someone said, I guess you're happy that you're, or doesn't he look happy? So happy is a word we hear all the time. Now, the way our brain works with language is it insists on naming something or insists on knowing, wanting to know what a word means. So if we've used the word happy all our life, then each of us have a meaning we attach to that word. Okay. Now, I'm just going to talk about me here. And I can tell you that I, that I have talked about this with many addicts, thousands of addicts and uh, in recovery, and they pretty much identify with me. I now realize that I never experienced true happiness until I was in sobriety a couple of years. Now, did I use the word happy to describe my emotional state? Yes, all the time. We all do. But today, it has a different meaning than it did. In hindsight, when I would use the word happy, it meant I'm busy and entertained. Case in point, if you would have said to me when I was 25 years old, Gary, tell me some times in your life when you were happy. Well, I was happy when I got my first horse. I was happy when I got my first motorcycle. I was happy when I got my first car. I was happy when I got my first girl. Everything I would name you would be something outside of myself brought that feeling in here. I had no idea, and I mean this, I had no idea that happiness was a feeling that people had in here and it was not dependent upon anything out there. I didn't know that. Uh, and there are other people, I talk to addicts all the time who will agree that, that are, uh, you know, one of the promises in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on the bottom of page 83 and 84 there, they're called the promises. It says, and, and, and by the way, when those promises are in the big book, it's after a person has completed working the first nine steps of the program and are on step 10 at least. Uh, that's where you find it in the book, and it makes some promises. 
And, and one of the promises there says you will know a new happiness. So what used to be happiness to you will have a new meaning. That's been my personal experience with that. So I use the word happy, but I have never truly experienced true happiness and contentment. All right? Now, had I never experienced happiness and content, I certainly had not experienced experienced any peace and serenity. Now, another one of those promises, the same place in that book, says you will comprehend the word serenity and you will know peace. So those are some big promises it's saying. It's saying if you can stop using and work these steps, you're going to experience some feelings that you have never experienced before up on this end of the scale. Now, that's been my personal experience and that's been millions, I believe, of addicts and recoveries experience. Is they, they, if we want to use this, they have moved up to this end of the scale uh, that they had never experienced before. All right, so that's eight. Now let's go to number nine here. And I'm going to put something number nine here that social drinkers are not going to relate to, I don't think. Addicts will, I promise. On number nine, I'm going to put chemical high. The feeling that the addict gets or the feeling that the addict got when they first, probably the first time they used what ended up being their drug of choice. Now, when I do this lecture for addicts, I put it at a 9 on purpose instead of a 10. And, and I will, when, I, when I present what I just said to you, that I'm putting a 9 on a 10 scale as chemical high. I will ask the room full of addicts, does anybody object that I put chemical high as a 9 on a 10 scale? And for a minute, nobody will respond. And then finally, somebody will raise their hand, and I'll say, what do you object to? Why don't you make it a 10 uh, or a 12 on a 10 scale? Now, well, again, I use that term. I use the term earth people affectionately, OK? Uh, I, my wife is a social drinker. And if I were to say to Jane, uh, Jane, on that scale of one to ten, when you have a margarita, would you say how, would you tell me what that feeling you get? And she would probably say a four or a five. Okay, uh, but trust me. And we talked about some in our first session about the difference in the addict, uh, the, the the value that the addict places on the, using the drug compared to recreational or social users. But anyway. So we're going to put it a 9 on a 10 scale, and we'll just leave 10 alone right there. All right? Now, so what we've done is we've taken feelings, started on the most negative feeling, less negative, less negative, less negative, positive, more positive, more positive, and bam, we put 9 there as chemical high. Now, last time, the last two times we touched on the idea of euphoric recall. Uh, we may have called it a hypermemory. But we got to bring that into account here. And that's one thing that separates normal users from, or recreational users, from addicts, is euphoric recall. The addict, in the addict's mind, what they remember is the very best feeling they ever got from their drug of choice. We talked about that when we touched on them. And we even talked about it last week, I think. Um, which is kind of a delusional memory because if you ask the addict how long ago was it when you got that 9 or that 10 on a 10 scale, they will say, oh, well, that was 10 years ago. But what do you remember every time you anticipate using again? Well, I remember that 9 or 10. So their brain is anticipating that even though intellectually they can acknowledge that, no, they don't get that anymore. So that's kind of a phenomenon of addiction, and we'll call it euphoric. Dr. Johnson called it euphoric recall, so our scientists today call it hypermemory. Uh, so I, I needed to say that about the nine, okay? Now, let's take two people, like I said, and let's introduce them to the drug alcohol, and let's see what happens to them once they're introduced to the drug. All right, the first person we're going to, uh, let me introduce you to Sam and Tom up here first. 
Sam Tom, both 16 years old. There's nothing unusual looking about either of these guys. They're very nondescript guys. They're not too tall, too short, too thin, too big, too anything. They're very nondescript, average looking guys. If, if, if Tom and Sam were really up here, and I ask you to tell me something unusual looking about either of the guys, you would be pretty hard put to find something. And I'm stressing that because I'm going to say, once we put them on the feeling scale and talk about their emotions, they're going to be significantly different people. But on the, uh, on the exterior, there's nothing unusual looking about them, okay? So let's take Tom first. Let's, let, we have to have a scenario that we can introduce him to it. So he's 16 years old. Let's say he's in the 10th grade. And Tom has a friend at school named Timmy Smith. And for whatever reason, Timmy's parents uh, have always allowed him to have a lot of parties. The family has taken the basement and turned it into a recreation room there. And he has a lot, not wild, crazy parties, but he's known to have parties. When a lot of his friends' birthdays, they'll have the party at Timmy's house or Halloween parties, Valentine parties, Fourth of July. It's the party place, okay? Doesn't have a bad reputation, it's the, but it's the party place. All right. Timmy's having a party Saturday night, and he's got a list of people who are coming to the party. Tom's name is on the list. Timmy approaches Tom at school, says, Tom, I'm having a party. My house, Saturday night, starts at 8 o'clock, down in the basement. You've been there before. Guys are going to be there. The girls are going to be there. We'll have refreshments. We'll be listening to music, dancing, laughing, joking, having a good time. I want you to be at the party. Tom says, okay. So he's going to go to the party. Now, let's back up a minute and let's talk about Tom before we send him to the party. Okay? Tom, at 16, has never experienced suicidal despair. He has no idea what that's like. If he were in a room and I went over the different degrees, he would say, I don't get you. I don't, I don't relate to that. Good. Deep depression. No, he's never been in a deep depression. Has he ever been depressed? Well, of course he has. All people get depressed. But he's never been in a deep depression. <clears throat> By age 16, do you think, though, he's may experience some guilt, shame, grief, and anger? Well, of course he has by age 16. So let's say the lowest Tom has ever been on our feeling scale that we designed is a three. Okay? Restless, irritable, discontent, yes, at age six, certainly he's had those feelings. Busy and entertained, well, yes, he's 16, he likes to stay busy and entertained. But let me tell you something about Tom that I call unusual, but it's probably normal. By age 16, Tom knew the difference between being happy and content and busy and entertained. He wasn't like I said I was, and like so many addicts in recovery say they were. For whatever many reasons, he knows what happy and content is, and he knows that that's apart from being busy and entertained. As a matter of fact, in his young life, Tom has experienced some moments of peace and serenity. You know, he's had some moments of that. So let's see what we got here with Tom. The lowest he's ever been on the feeling scale is a three. Highest he's ever been on the feeling scale is an eight. Like all humans, he ranges back and forth between those two extremes, dependent upon a lot of factors. But what we're going to do, because we can do it as a theory, we can do what we want to, we're going to average all the feelings Tom has ever had up and divide it by the number of hours he's been awake or alive, and we're going to say, okay, I, I understand what he feels at his best, and I understand what he feels at his lowest, but what does he feel on an average? And let's say when we do that, we find out that on an average, Tom feels a six and a half. We're going to call that Tom's normal. That's what normal is. So if you walked up to Tom today and said, Tom, how are you feeling? He said, best I've ever felt. Probably referring to an eight. Worst I've ever felt. He'd probably be referring to a three. I'm about normal. He'd be referring to a six and a half, okay? 
So that's him on the scale. That's his low. That's his high. And now let's take him to the party. All right. He's invited to the party. He's looking forward to it. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of fun. All right. He arrives at the party. Uh, and Timmy's house there, there's a little, little stoop there you walk on. And then you walk inside the front door. There's a little foyer there. And then there's some stairs that go down right to the left in the foyer, go down to the basement. And down at the bottom of the stairs, there's some double doors that open up into the rec room. All right. Tom arrives at the party, walks in the house, knows his way. He's been there before. Goes down the stairs, opens the door, surveys the room. A lot of the guys and gals have gotten there. He sur surveys the room, and he walks out, and he starts joining them, laughing and talking. He's telling something funny that happened at school this week. He's fitting in and doing real well at the party having a good time. Maybe a girl there that he likes. He may even be dancing with her. So Tom's at the party having a good time. Somebody walks up to Tom and says, Tom, have you ever tried alcohol? Remember at this point, he never has. He says, no. And they say, why don't you try it tonight? It will make you feel better than you normally feel. Well, do you think a 16-year-old is curious about that proposition? Well, of course he is. So he's curious about it in the beginning. And he's thinking about what the guy just said to him, why don't I try some alcohol? Well, he looks around the room, and over there against the wall, there's a couple of guys from school that are real popular, and they happen to be sipping on a 12-ounce beer. So he's curious, curiosity, and then he sees these two popular guys sipping on a beer, that brings another factor into it we call peer pressure. So for two reasons, Tom decided to try alcohol, curiosity and peer pressure, all right? But he only drinks two 12-ounce beers very slowly over the course of the whole five-hour party. He doesn't chug a lug a bunch of beer and get drunk and dance naked on a table, and pee in a punch bowl, and hit on Timmy's mama. So, now, I heard that's what alcoholics. I've never been guilty of any of that stuff, okay? I, I heard alcoholics did those things. Now, nothing like that happened, okay? He just drank a little bit very gradually. Let's see what did happen to him. He was at the party. He was feeling normal. He drank his two beers. Put him a nine. What did they say to him? What did they promise him? It will make you feel better than you normally feel. Did it? Yes. He would have had a good time at the party, but because of the two beers, he had a better time, just like they promised him. Nothing went wrong. He didn't drink enough. He didn't have a hangover. Nothing like that happened. He didn't act crazy. He goes home that night. After the party's over, he goes to bed. The effects of the alcohol wear off while he's asleep. The next morning, he wakes up back to normal. Well, at that point, Tom says to himself, that was a pretty cool experience I had last night. I went to a party. I was having a good time. I drank a, on a couple of beers. I had a better time than I would have normally had. Came home, went to sleep, woke up the next day, back to where I started. No worse for the wear. That was a pretty positive experience. The next time I'm at a party, I think I'll do that again. No reason for him not to, is it? So he has learned, as Dr. Johnson used to say, he's learned the mood swing. He can chemically swing his mood up by ingesting something. That's why all people ingest mood altering subs. So he begins to do that. When he goes to parties, he begins to have a couple of beers because he has a better time. Well, one night he's at a party, and someone says to him, says, Tom, I've noticed you've been uh, having a couple of beers at these parties. And he goes, yeah. Why is that? Well, I, you know, I just seem to have a better time if I drink a couple of beers. Well, the guy says to him, says, why don't you try six beers tonight? That'll make you feel three times better. Well, he's never heard, now he's not, you know, he's pretty uh, a novice here, this thing. So he doesn't know yet there's not a such thing as what we call addict math. Now, addicts seem to be born with that that six make you feel three times better than two. Uh, but uh, uh, Tom has never... So he thinks about what the guy says, and, and the guy says it'll make you feel three times better. Well, I'll try that. 
So that night, instead of drinking his two beers, Tom actually drank six beers. Well, sure enough, the six beers make him feel somewhat better than the two beers would, yes. So there is a benefit he gets from the extra four beers. That's true enough. But something else happens that night. He gets drunk. And because he gets drunk, he does all kinds of things that he would never typically do. Things such as dance naked on the table, <laughs> pee in the punch bowl, and hit on Timmy's mama. All right? He would have never done those things otherwise until he got intoxicated. Well, he gets home that night, and he passes out instead of going to sleep. And the next morning, he wakes up, and he experiences his first hangover. He goes, oh, God, my hair hurts. So now we've got a downside to it, don't it? He says, I've got to get better just to die. And he's really, really never had a hangover before. He's really sick. And he's laying there for a few minutes, and he says, man, something's wrong here. And he opens his old blurry eyes, and he looks, and sometime in the middle of the night, he had thrown up in the bed. Oh, God, he's grossed out now. So he's got a hangover, and he's grossed out, and he starts saying, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Mom and Daddy are going to know I was drinking. He starts getting real worried, and then he starts remembering what he did last night. Oh, no, please tell me I did not do that. Why did I dance that pee in the punch? Surely I didn't say that to Timmy's mama. Surely I didn't say that to her. So the next day, after drinking the extra four beers, he doesn't come back to normal, does he? He comes all the way back to three. And at that point, his logic goes into action, and he says to himself, let's see, I can be feeling normal and drink two beers, and it makes me feel like this. The next day, I'm back to normal. Or I can be feeling normal and drink six beers. Sure enough, it makes me feel this much better. But if I do that the next day, I don't stop at normal. So this is the benefit then of the extra four beers. And this would be the cost. He says, you know, that's not a very good trade-off. I think from now on I'll just drink two. And enters the life of a social drinker. Okay, My wife, Jane, and uh, like I said, she is a social drinker. And I've never seen her have over one beer or one margarita in a sitting like four or five hour stretch, all right? And, uh, and I was asking her about that. I think I shared this last week. And I said to her one time, I said, have you ever been drunk? And she said, God, yes. I got drunk one time when I was in college. And that was 30 years earlier. And she, I, didn't, I don't know what happened. I didn't ask her. That was before me. But whatever it was humiliated her so much that when she even thinks about that, it still causes her to win. So it wasn't worth it, and she hasn't made the mistake since then. Okay? Now, that's what we call normal. We, I know we have some social drinkers, and all percentage-wise, there's always people. And there's probably been times when you did have more to drink than you probably needed. And you probably identify not quite so much maybe with Tom dancing naked on the table or peeing in the punch bowl, but you probably said or did some things that were embarrassing to you, and the next day you said, I'm not doing that again, it's not worth it. And from then on, you've probably been able to cut back and use the amount that keeps you from doing that. That's called normal, okay? This is not. All right, now. Okay, so that's Tom's story. Now, we've got to talk about Sam now. Remember, Sam's 16 years old, too. Uh, let's put him on the feeling scale, and then we're going to send him to the party, too, okay? Uh, 
He's 16 now, but four years earlier when he was 12 years old, he was going through a particular time in his life when he got very depressed about something that was going on and the thought crossed his mind that, you know what, I might just be better off dead. Now, he didn't act on it and he didn't tell anybody about it and eventually it went away. But what we know is that he had experienced some degree of suicidal despair. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. What in the world could have caused a 12-year-old to experience suicidal despair? Now, when I ask that question to audience, uh, they will usually come up with some pretty traumatic reason. He was abused or divorce of parents or something like that. And I will go, yes, that could have been true. However, I do want you to understand, though, that everybody doesn't deal with stress the same. And this is a lot of genetic predisposition, too. A lot of it is genetically predisposed about how people deal with stress. Let me make an example here. Let's say that I've got a little rubber ball in my hand. And I'm going to let that represent my, my brain, about the right size, too. And I'm going to use this pen here to represent a source of stress. Let's say it's the death of a loved one. That's a pretty stressful event. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the rubber ball, and I'm going to take the stressor, the death of a loved one, and I'm going to insert it onto the rubber ball and mash in with pressure. And what you're going to see happen is you're going to see an indentation in that rubber ball. When I remove the stressor after some time passes, you will see the stressor is removed and the rubber ball springs back to its original shape. So we can say, in this, using this analogy, a rubber ball is resilient to stress. Did it affect, was it, did it have an effect? Yes. When it was present, it did, but afterwards, it's resilient, it sprang back to, now let's take a ping pong ball the exact, exact same diameter. Let's take the exact same stressor, death of a loved one, let's exert it under the ping pong ball with the exact same amount of pressure and we'll see pretty much the exact same indentation. Except when I remove the stressor, what happens to the ping pong ball? Remains dented. So we can say it's, I know that's a real oversimplified way, but it's still valid. So we can say the ping pong ball is vulnerable to stress and the rubber ball is resilient. Well, we all have that. We're all somewhere uh, uh, between those two extremes. We're either super resilient or super uh, uh, vulnerable. And all of us are somewhere on that spectrum. Well, let's say that Sam was super uh, 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 vulnerable to stress. So it may not have been some event that you might think of like uh, being abused or something horrible like that. It could have been he didn't make the baseball team. And, you know, and what? Yes, that, it could be that. So I just want to clarify that because the reason I'm doing that is because I don't want to leave the idea that everybody who is, is becomes addicted has some huge horrible stressor in their life or some, some issue of abuse or something like that. That is just not true. It is true in some, but not true. And so it could be just be the, the, the genetic vulnerability that some people have towards stress. I believe as a child, I think I was very vulnerable to stress. I, you know, I don't know. I've only had one life, but I think I was in hindsight. Uh, compared to my resilience that I've learned today, I'm, I'm sure I was very vulnerable. Okay. Anyway, enough about that. So, but what we do know is that by age 16, Sam had experienced suicidal despair, all right? What about deep depression? Oh, yeah, he had experienced deep depression. Matter of fact, he had experienced probably a good bit of it, but it never was diagnosed by a professional or anything. A lot of the teachers said he just doesn't seem to concentrate. He stares out the window, puts his head on the desk a lot, just a, but what we know, because it's our, our theory we can do, uh, he, was, he was experiencing a good bit of deep depression, too. Guilt, shame, grief, and anger, you think he's had a lot of that? Oh, yeah, he's had plenty of that. Restless, irritable, discontent, and bored, 
That was kind of his natural state, actually. Busy and entertained? Oh, yes. He really, really loved busy and entertained because if it wasn't busy and entertained, it was something down here. So, of course, he enjoyed staying busy and entertained. Now, unlike Tom, Sam had never experienced true happiness. So what we're going to say then is the highest Sam has ever been on the feeling scale is a six. And the lowest he's ever been on the feeling scale is a one. So what we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing we did with Tom. We're going to add them all up, average them up, and say, well, what does he feel on an average, though? And when we do that, what we're going to find is on an average, Sam feels a three and a half. And we're going to call that Sam's normal. Okay? Now, normal is a relative word. Let, let me make an example. Let's say Tom walks up to Sam and says, how, Sam, how are you feeling today? And Sam says to Tom, I'm feeling about normal. What is Tom going to automatically assume he's referring to in context of the scale? Bad. And vice versa. They have no way of knowing that what they call normal is different. We can do this because we're doing it in a theory thing. All right. All right. So uh, this is Sam's normal. Now let's, let's introduce Sam to alcohol. Remember that party Timmy was having? I'll tell you a little history about that. Uh, Sam's name was originally not on the invite list of Timmy's party. But Timmy's mom and Sam's mom are good friends. So Timmy's mom is looking at his invitation list, and she noticed Sam's name is not on there. And she says, you haven't, you're not inviting Sam to the party. What's going on here? He said, Mom, you know, uh, Sam's been here before to parties. And he really, really seems to have a miserable time when he's here. He just stays off by himself. He doesn't mix anything. I don't think he really enjoys parties. And I'm just going to, you know, spare him that misery. And mom says, no, you're not. No, you're not because his mom's a friend of mine. And you're going to invite him to the party. Tim says, fine, mom. I like Sam. Okay. I don't mind asking him to the party. Sure, I'll ask him. All right. So Timmy finds Sam at school. So Sam, having a party, my house, Saturday night, down in the basement. You've been there before. Guys will be there. Girls will be there. Be having refreshments, dancing, laughing, joking, having a good time. I want you to be at my party. Sam thinks a minute and he says, uh, okay, I'll be there. But he doesn't intend to go. He's planning on dodging the party. Well, he gets home and Mom says, so have you been invited? I hear Timmy's having a party Saturday night. Have you been invited? Yeah. yeah. Are you going to go? No, I'm not going. Why? I don't know. I just don't want to go. Mom says, yes, you are going. Remember the politics. His mom's a friend of mine. You are going. So she drives him to the party and kicks his butt out and says, get to the party. <laughs> so here's Sam. He's going to the party. He's all dejected. Doesn't really want to be there. Goes in the front door. He walks down the steps. Bottom of the stairs, he opens the door, he surveys the scene. All the guys and the gals are out there dancing, laughing, joking, having a good time. Sam goes over here and finds him a wall to hold up. He's at the party in body, but he's not having a good time. He is very uncomfortable. He just doesn't do parties well in crowds. He's sitting there having a miserable time, and somebody walks up to him, and says, Sam, have you ever tried alcohol? And he says, no, I haven't. And they go, why don't you try it tonight? It will make you feel better than you normally feel. He's curious about that proposition. He looks around the room, sees the two popular guys over there sipping on a beer. Peer pressure. So for two reasons, Tom decides to try alcohol that night. Curiosity and peer pressure. Sam, did I say Sam? What reasons did Tom try it? Curiosity and peer pressure. Why, what two reasons does anyone decide to try a mood-altering substance? Either curiosity and or peer pressure. One doesn't try it because he's immoral. 
or he's stupid or weak-minded. Everybody decides to try it for the same reason. Okay? It has nothing to do with morality or, or intelligence. Okay? So that night, for the first time in his life, Sam drinks alcohol. However, he only drinks two 12-ounce beers very gradually over the course of the whole five-hour party. He doesn't get drunk, dance naked on the table, pee in the punch bowl, hit on, none of that stuff, all right? That's not what happens. Let's see what does happen to him. He's at the party. Here's how he's feeling. He drinks his two beers. Bam. Magic. First time in his life, he understands parties. It gave, it was perfect. He gets out there, and he's a, a very funny guy. He's got a good sense of humor. He gets out there, and he starts telling jokes, and all of his peers are laughing at his jokes, and he's out there fitting in. And he's having, Listen, there's a little girl there at the party that he's been admiring at school from afar. Perfect. The two beers were just right. It gave him the courage to approach her. He approached her and he started talking to her. She seemed to like him. He danced with her. The guy had never danced in his life, except maybe at home in front of a mirror. He would never dare dance, but those two beers were magic. And he got out there and he danced and he had a magical, mystical night that night. Nothing bad happened. He went home that night. He went to sleep. The effects of the alcohol wore off. And he was back to normal. Let's revisit Tom for just a minute. Remember Tom's first experience? Not when he got drunk. It's the first time he tried it. Uh, he was feeling this and it made him that. The next day, he said to him, the next morning, he said, that was pretty cool. The next time I'm at a party... I think I may do it again. What do you think Sam said to himself after his first experience? That was magic. Let's have a party so I can do it again. So from the very beginning, one of them places a lot more value on the experience than the other. Okay? So he really likes it. All right? So... Doesn't take him long, and nobody has to suggest to him, why don't you try six? Because he is like me. He was born with attic math. And so the next time he's at Timmy's, as quick as matter of fact, I think he went and sold Timmy, won't you have another party? Uh, and the next time he's at Timmy's party, nobody has to suggest to him, he's already figured that out. If two made me feel that good, six will make me feel three times. So the next time he's at a party, he doesn't drink two. He drinks six. And sure enough, those four extra beers do make him feel that much better. He does get a benefit from it. But something else happens to him that night, right? Do I have to go through it again? <laughs> he gets drunk, dance naked on the table, pee in the punch bowl, hit on Miss Smith, comes home that night, Throws up in the bed, wakes up all grossed out, laying there, starts remembering what he did and said last night. Oh, God, no, I didn't do that. Because he has a value system exactly like Tom's. It's not that he's immoral. So instead of coming back to normal after drinking those six beers, he comes back to a three. Well, at that point, he analyzes the situation, too, and he says, let's see. I can be feeling normal and drink six beers, and this is what it will make me feel. But if I do that the next day, this is the price I have to pay. Let's see here. Benefit cost. 
benefit. I don't know where you went to business school here, but in that equation, the benefit far outweighs the cost, doesn't it? So he is willing to pay that price in order to get that magic. I remember I started getting in trouble at age 16 from drinking alcohol, and my dad wasn't a, he was a good man, but he, he wasn't an easy guy. And I started getting some pretty severe punishment. But you know what? He wouldn't catch me very often. Maybe once every six weeks. Yeah, I'd get it then. But the rest of the time, I wouldn't. I'd get that magic. I'm willing to pay that price. So Sam is willing to pay that kind of a price to get the magic. So he continues to do it. Now, let's see what happens. Several things begin to happen. One thing is, again, Sam is not a sociopath. He has a conventional value system. And the more he gets loaded, the more his behavior conflicts with his values. More conflicts going on in his life. The more grief and shame and guilt he begins to develop as a result of his behavior. Let's see what begins to happen to Sam's normal. Compared to Tom, it was nothing to write home about anyway, was it? But now, as a result of his using, his normal begins to move even further down the scale as a result of his substance abuse. This is when we're looking at entering into addiction now. Well, the lower his normal gets on the feeling scale, remember we talked about this early on? Touched on it several times. Euphoric recall, the addict's ability to remember the very best high they've ever gotten in their life. Well, guess what? The lower his normal gets down the feeling scale, the more he wants to achieve that. So the more he uses. Well, the more he uses, the more conflict. The lower his normal gets. He's now entering into an addiction stage. Let's say at some point in his life, Sam, now, this is his normal. This is now his normal. And he's just using now, and he's building a tolerance, so he's not getting that magic, but he still remembers that. He's using now just to feel what used to be what? Normal. Now we can say he's in the addiction cycle now, looking at it from an emotional point of view. Now, let's say that Sam has a moment of clarity and something particularly bad happened or whatever, and he gets interrupted from his using his drug. Let me say something else that's happened too, all right? Let's look at, it, let's look at this at another angle too. Let's, take, let's go back and take Tom for just a minute. Right, Tom, did Tom like alcohol? Yes. But was he willing for it to, to uh, cause him problems? No. And so here, let's Tom, let's say he's 17 now, and someone walks up to Tom and says, Tom, would you like to try some of this marijuana? Tom probably says, well, you know, it's illegal. And if I get caught with it, it's going to cause a lot of problems, and it's probably not going to be worth the feeling that I get. I think I'll pass. Let's take Sam. Sam, you think the alcohol is magic? Try this. This is really magic. What do you think Sam's attitude is going to be? Let's give it a whirl. And so that's that other thing that we see in addicts. Even if 95% of them begin with alcohol, you see them begin to what we call in the business trade up. They begin to go to that next drug and go to that next drug. Well, normal social drinkers don't do that. They don't have that much value on the experience of, of altering their mood. It doesn't mean as much to them. So they're able to weigh the possible consequences and go, no, I don't think I'll try that. It's not worth it. But the addict has already gotten that magic from early on, and when you offer him or her that next drug, yeah, let's try it. I might get in trouble, but boy, it might be worth it. 
And so that's another thing that begins to happen. Okay. So anyway, now let's get back to Sam. The more he uses, the lower his normal gets on the scale. The lower his normal gets on the scale, the more he wants to get that feeling again, the more he uses. Okay. Well, he has some kind of a consequence, and it gets his attention, and he has a moment of clarity, and he suddenly realizes, you know what? This is not working out. Yes, I like to use, but now I'm beginning to see that the more I use, the worse I feel, and the worse I feel, the more I use. You know what I think I need to do? I need to quit using. So Sam reaches the conclusion that I am not going to get high anymore. And I mean it. Well, by the time he reached there, where is his normal? It's way down here. But I'm not going to do this anymore, and I mean it. I've sworn off. I'm not going to do it. Well, here's my normal now. So they might, nobody would like to feel like this normally, would they? So what is the next best feeling that Sam got? Remember when we were talking about Sam, Bill, putting him on the scale? Next to chemical high, the next best feeling he had was what? Being busy and entertained. So, of course, since he's sworn off of this and he means it, doesn't want to feel like this, he tries to get real busy and entertained. And you'll see Sam go through that phase where he's just busy, busy, busy and entertained. And if he plays a lot of games or whatever, he's got to, got to keep distracted. Uh, if he's not distracted by something, he's going to be restless, irritable, and discontent. So you see him really try. Now, I, I, I think it would be fair to say in Sam's case, when he makes a decision that he's going to quit using and he puts all his energy into staying busy and entertained, I think it would be fair to say he's probably doing the best he can at that time. I think he is doing the best that he knows how to do at that time. So that's what he does. But what begins to happen, you can't stay busy and entertained all the time, can you? But he's trying, and eventually he begins to lose ground, and he starts getting restless, irritable, discontented, and he tries to stay busy and entertained, but he just keeps, he's constantly losing ground. No matter how hard he's trying, he's losing ground, and he keeps getting back down here in this depression, and even maybe way on down here maybe. Because see, what's happened now, he's quit using the drugs, and those drugs have chemically repressed a lot of his guilt and shame and a lot of his negative feelings. Well, now that he's not using anymore, they begin to come to the surface. So he's trying, and I'm, I'm going to say this again. I think in some cases we can honestly say that Sam is doing the best he knows how to do by trying to stay busy and entertained. But eventually, all the time he's doing that, this euphoria, I call him Old Slick. Old Slick is following him around and saying, remember how I made you feel, remember how I made you feel, remember how I made you feel, remember how, this time it'll be different, this time it'll be different. That's old voice of Slick, I call it. And so here Sam is down here trying his best, but losing ground, old Slick's whispering in his ear. Folks, in a situation like that, it's not if Sam use. It's when does Sam use. And sure enough, Sam eventually falls weak and he tries to use again and starts using again. Okay? So when I'm doing this lecture with addicts and treatment, by this time I have really gotten their attention because they, I heard a young lady not too long ago, two or three months ago, in our young adult program, she was about 21 years old, and I was doing this lecture for them, and the, when I got done, they, they were falling out of the room, and I heard her say, I am so Sam. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> they really relate to Sam in this lecture, addicts do. They really relate to Sam. Uh, and, and so by the time I'm this, they, they're saying, that's me. That's what's happening to me. That's what I've done. That looks just like me. And so I say, okay, what if, what if I could say, Sam, what if I could introduce you to a regimen that if you participate in this regimen fully, that what it is designed to do 
is take your normal that's ended up way down here, right? By the time it gets to treatment, it's down here. And very gradually began to move it up this feeling scale. Very gradually. This regimen will vary. Boy, they hate that. They get sick of me saying very gradual. And I'll go, what, what? You know, addicts don't like very gradual anything. You know, don't talk about very gradual. I'm sorry, I didn't make the rules. What if I could introduce you to a regimen that if you would commit to it and stick to it, it would very gradually start moving you back up this feeling scale non-chemically past what your normal was before you started using? Dare I say even further than that, very gradually? What if I'm saying to you that if you stick with this regimen long enough, you can actually have a normal that's way up here? We'll call that sounds new normal. What if I could do that? What if I could introduce you to it? Would the equation change? Well, of course it would. Let's look at the equation now. Let's say, and, and let, let me say this about, about that regimen that I'm so freely referring to there. I think it's important when I'm teaching patients to let them know this regimen that I'm speaking of, I can make you some promises about this regimen. One, it's probably going to be the most inconvenient thing you have ever done in your life. You just think you've been inconvenienced. You join up with this regimen, you're going to have a new definition of inconvenience because every time you turn around, somebody's going to be asking you to do something that's inconvenient. Like go to those damn meetings. <laughs> go to those damn... It's too, I'm tired. I've been working all day. I don't want to go to that damn meeting, you know. Okay. Get a sponsor. You know, I don't want to get a sponsor. Uh, work the steps. Well, I started on step four and it bummed me out. So it's, it's, it's important that I communicate that. I don't want to get them the idea that ain't nobody's selling any magic here, okay. If they do this and if they stick to it, I will promise them that it's going to be the most inconvenient thing they've ever done in their life, and it's going to really ask them to get outside their emotional comfort zone more than they ever have in their life. So it's a big deal, and a lot of people are not willing. They would like, they, they buy into the feeling scale. Yes, I'd like to be up here. Of course I would. But I'm not willing to be inconvenienced or have to get outside my emotional comfort zone in order to do it. I want my cake and eat it too. I want it to be easy. Well, I'm sorry. I don't have that one. I don't have that answer. There's no easy way. For, I don't believe. Using this scale, the context of where we use to get back up this scale takes a while, and you have to deal with a lot of this stuff that's created instead of cover it up with drugs. You have to let it come to the surface and work the steps and deal with it and take responsibility for all you've done and make amends and begin to live differently. It's a big deal. But... If Sam can do that and stick to it, then this will be his new normal. Now, remember I talked about those promises after step 10, after step 9 in the big book. You will know a new happiness. You will comprehend the word serenity and you will know peace. You will not re regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Those promises that they're making to addicts if we want to translate it into the feeling scale, it's you will know a seven. You will know a seven in your life if you're willing to go to any lengths to do it. Okay. Now, so let's say Sam has got what it takes. He's got the willingness. Now, let me talk a minute here again, and I talk a lot about this in our family program. Uh, Aramie and D. Mew, Aramie uh, Denley and D. Mew, Mew that do our our uh, two-day intensive family therapy program do a great job. I'll put our family program up against any in the United States. That's how good it is. 
but they always want me to talk to the, to the family members about the difference between enthusiasm and willingness. And they are exact opposite. Anybody, I don't think anybody would be enthusiastic about this journey I'm talking about if there's something really seriously mentally wrong with them. All right? So you don't have to be enthusiastic. Matter of fact, I can't imagine being enthusiastic about early recovery. You know, people get on what they call a pink cloud for a little while, but then they come off that pretty quick. Uh, you know, when your enthusiasm leaves you, which it will do in this process, then you better have willingness. And willingness is just the sheer guts to do it, just the discipline to do it, whether you want to or not. And, and that's where I think, you know, uh, Porter, we run into problems. I don't think it's lack of desire to get clean. I think they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think when we start saying, well, here's the things you have to do to do it, oh, no, wait a minute, that's too much. I'm, not, I, I'm too busy. I'm not willing to do that. I got to do this or I got to do that. And they get the priorities wrong. So, and I, and I, I want to go ahead, and it takes a lot of courage to do this. Anybody who's in recovery will take, tell you they probably won't argue with what I just said. The first year of recovery is the most inconvenient year of their life, and they've probably been asked to get outside their emotional comfort zone more than they ever have in their entire life. So, I, I, and I, I think it's my responsibility not just to tell you people and family members that, but to make sure the patients hear that. I don't want to get, there's no pie in the sky, folks. Uh, so anyway, but let's say, let me get back, let's finally finish this thing up. Let's say that Sam has got the courage to do this, and sure, after a year and a half or two years, this is his new normal. Does that mean he will never remember how good it felt to get high? No, unfortunately, he's going to be able to remember that for the rest of his life. I wish, he, I wish that wasn't true. But when he remembers that, he goes, let's see. I can go and shoot some heroin tonight, and it's going to move me from my, my markers running out here. I use a black one. It's going to move me from here to here tonight if I go shoot some heroin. Yep, that's what it'll do. But if it does that the next day, this is where I'm going to be. Nah, that's not a very good deal. I think I'll pass tonight. Okay. Is this making sense? All right. And again, I don't think it's any secret how much importance I put on the 12-step program. Now, let me say this. The 12-step program is not the end-all and do-all. It doesn't even claim to be. If anybody says they represent AA or NA and you don't need anything except the 12 steps, they haven't read the literature. It doesn't say that. There are other things that people need to do often to, to, in recovery. There's, you know, there's co-occurring uh, mood disorders and things like that. And, and so I, I want to make sure that everybody, I don't, uh, I believe there's so much help out there today, but I still believe, and, and most psychiatrists who understand addiction will tell you that probably the 12-step program is probably the most important thing an addict can do to recover. And if you say, what about the medications? Well, that can help them too. But I, I do want to say that. So that's what I believe. I'm selling that. I sell the, and I don't, I don't apologize for that. There's nothing magic about it. But I believe that that's the solution. Uh, and, and, you know, and I, I can get up here and say, well, this is, I'm Sam, guys. This is my story. And, but, folks, I've been doing this for a long time. I have known so many thousands of Sam's who told me this was their story too. So I think it really relates to, uh, I think most addicts relate to this thing. So we're going to, uh, we're going to go ahead and close and let y'all out a little early tonight. How's that go? I'm sorry, what did I do wrong? Uh, I don't know. Uh,
Let's say ecstasy, but not the, not the, not the chemical kind, okay? Let's say that's something even beyond that, okay? And an addict at 10 is a chemical eye, I'll tell you. Addict will say it's a 15 on a 10 scale, okay? Anybody else got any questions? Comments? Wisecracks? Anything? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I've really enjoyed this these last uh, three weeks doing this, and I, I hope you got something out of it because I really uh, have a lot of pleasure of coming and talking to addicts, family members. That, uh, that's kind of what it's all about for me. Thank you all a lot. Thank you.